We have a special event emphasizing through this year and last year's sequence of workshops, seminars, the conception of spiritual warriorship. And we have been emphasizing that spiritual life should not just be something that is conceptual, theoretical, but it should be a part of our lifestyle. So I want to especially address for a short time the idea of uh, warriorship in terms of what that means for us now and how it can help us to break through or transcend many of the bombardment stagnations that we're now experiencing. I first want to invoke blessings from my spiritual master and to uh, ask for permission to speak to you in a way that can go beyond just addressing the mind, the intelligence, the senses, etc. So I would like to make a small opening prayer, and the prayer is just uh, giving reference to my uh, spiritual master, Sri Prabhupada, and his ability to open the eyes of many souls and to guide us in understanding more about what's called the Samam Bonam of the Accident. Uh, universal truthism, ancient wisdom, universal knowledge that is relevant to all mankind, humankind, etc. If you excuse me for a second. Om Maganati Miranyasya Janajana Shalakshaya Shakshu Niritam Yena Tasmai Sri Guru Vena Maha Sri Chaitanya Nama Obisam Sapitam Yena Bhutale Vayam Rupakada Mayam Sadanti Sapadanti Kam Namaho Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pasaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Nitsini Namine Namaste Sarasati Deve Goravani Pacharine Nirvasa Hesha Sumjavahari Hasta Desatarine Vanshaka Pasta Rupyasta Vipa Sindhu Gahevata Patisha Nam Papa Vedyo Vaishnava Vedyo Namo Namaha. As we speak, whether as a guru or, of course, many of you know I've been coordinated as a chief or a king, the same conception is there is that one is not supposed to do things on their own account. The conception of, of, of chieftainship in its original uh, paradigm was that the king was to be a medium or like a connection from the higher kingdom to the mundane or material or secular world. And the spiritual master is even more so to be that. The duty is to act as a postman and to see that letters or messages are given according to how they're marked, how they're classified, and who's receptive to such messages. First, we have to take a, a serious look at today's situation and we see that there's a constant, tremendous uh, situation of chaos, of pandemonium, and dissonance. When we look at warriorship, we first look at the, uh, at the materialistic uh, scheme. We are now in what's called a multipolar world. There was a time only a few years ago, it was bipolar, and there was great demarcation between the major powers. Now we're at a time when coalition alignments are very, very transitory, things change practically from month to month, this is very dangerous. When there was World War I, World War II, we were also in a multipolar world order situation. So, secularly, mankind is in a very, very precarious time, uh, more than any time within the last few uh, decades. This is highly a weapon culture. The material world is referred to as the inferior or separated energies of the Lord. Bhumi Aponanavaya, Tamma Buddha Ivacha, Ahankarai Dhami, Vina Prakriti Yashtara. That the Lord has different Shakti, different energies. And the material universes are manifestations of the separate energies. In these particular arenas, there is always war, disease, death old age, etc. These are unnatural things. So we are now in what is called a weapon culture. The weapon culture aspect means that one, the majority of our academic resources, 25% of all sciences, scientific research is oriented toward weapons orientation. 
There's a basic philosophy in the material atmosphere. I kill you, you kill me, we kill them, they kill us. And let us all see how to perfect our ability to kill as fast, as rapid as we can. And now not only are there nuclear bombs, but neutron bombs and chemical weapons and biological weapons, weapons that can destroy the individual and leave the property. Because the human quality, the human factor is becoming less and less an important consideration. We're at a time when, uh, at any uh, 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 period in this particular century, almost one-fourth of the world's countries are in some type of scrimmage of war. We have a few of our educators here, I see three or four of them. One of the problems with today's education is also due to how much money is being spent in the military industrial complex. Worldwide, about $20,000 is used to educate, train, and prepare the average soldier in contrast to about $400 to uh, educate the average child, globally speaking. So obviously, what an individual, what a country, what a nation or nation spend their money for tells us a lot about their present as well as about the future. So while there's so much discussion about peaceful coexistence, there's still more and more involvement in perfecting ability to annihilate. We are at a time when there is a massive amount of matricide, that is destruction to Gomi, to Mother Earth. There's a massive amount of suicide, uh, ecocide, destruction to the cosmos, to the ethers of pollution and exploitation of oil, so many things. And we are experiencing even uh, deity side or deal side, which is even philosophy that annihilate the actual idea about the existence of, of the Godhead. And so with this kind of rampant input, we can see that we are at war. We are at war because one, whether it's just the bombardment from the political, the economical, the social arena, based on tribalism, sexism, racism, that creates incest, uh, abuse to the elderly, drug abuse, all of these are all part of the same scheme of chaos and basic destruction to humankind. That is going on primarily due to the fact that we are not appreciating that when we are in a war situation, we have to protect ourselves, we have to know how to in improve our resistance, and also how to combat certain negative influences. This brings us to the spiritual conception of warfareship. Materially, we are always under preparation for war or involved in some war, civil, racial, tribal, etc., and even potential nuclear. We are, as spiritual warriors, the idea is how the individual can be able to become natural. We are in an unnatural state when constantly our existence is being threatened. The human, what to say, of the spiritual quest is gradually being more and more obfuscated, checked. The, for one, to be a spiritual warrior, it is not an easy thing. Why? Because we are anti-material. Be in a material arena. We have a higher nature. Ipariyami prasanyam prakutam bidi mevram. Jiva bhutam mahabaho jayitam dajatejaka. Sometimes we will speak in ancient languages because those languages emanate a certain vibration that affects the soul and has ability to stimulate the consciousness, has ability to eradicate certain negative influences that are a part of our constant consciousness due to sensual absorption. As we see what has happened historically with those who have tried to be spiritual warriors, it helps us to realize, one, that every major prophet has been a warrior. It doesn't matter what tradition you're referring to, because such personalities have been revolutionists. Their basic existence has been to annihilate oppression, to annihilate injustice, to bring about the higher truths. And they do that in an environment that is rather hostile. 
If we look at the teachings of Zoroaster, uh, who helped to found Zoroastrianism, the Persian mystic, that he was stabbed simply because he tried to engage in conscious raising. Socrates was poisoned, was uh, executed, he had to take poison due to the fact that he was purported to be poisoning the youth by giving knowledge, dealing with uh, anti-material considerations. We look at the example of Buddha. He was stoned and harassed by the Orthodox Hindus. Prophet Muhammad was constantly being threatened, being chased, and also an attempted assassination through poison. Jesus, we see that he was nailed to a cross, crucified, even a common prisoner, Barabbas, who was a thief, was taken down so that Jesus could be executed. And we look at some other personalities that you have familiarity with due to your Western education, or should we say indoctrination, or miseducation. We find certain personalities like uh, Teresa of Avila, who was a nun. She had to run away from home just to be able to practice her life of simplicity and renunciation. St. Francis of Assisi, his uh, father, parents, relatives, they disowned him in the public. Some of you have experienced some of these same things based on your genuine desire in trying to be about conscious raising, because that is part of what happens. First, the prophet is very rarely uh, respected in their own home. Second, as you try to progress spiritually, there is natural unfoldment and challenges and tests, and the Supreme Lord often arranges so that many of those who are the closest to you become your biggest test to allow you to see which do you really want, the spiritual or the material. Thomas of Aquinas, he, uh, he was a celibate monk. His parents locked him up in a room with a prostitute with the idea that, oh, we'll break this guy's uh, vows. So constantly there are challenges, whether your challenge comes in the form of those who are most dear to you not understanding, or whether it comes in the form of other external forces constantly trying to give you some complications. It is one and two of the same thing. We should not think that if we are going to be serious about trying to be anti-material, we're going to be serious about trying to understand about Atma Vidya, the nature of the soul and its service and relationship to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, we should not be so naive to think that we will not also have to undergo some complications, some challenges. If we're looking simply for an easy ride, then spiritual environment, spiritual association, spiritual rejuvenation is not the place for such persons. One should go on not narcoticizing themselves while they are pretending to enjoy what's called chapala sukula or the temporary pleasures of material life. You may not necessarily, very few of you, hopefully none of you, will have to experience what some of these teachers had to experience, but we should know that we have some little test that has our name on it that we're going to have to undergo. And we can undergo those things with great zeal and enthusiasm, realizing that it is part of the evolution, part of our chance to engage in warfare for conscious raising and for service to, to the Godhead. Violence is a part of war. But there is often violence within nonviolence. And sometimes there is violence that is actually nonviolent. What does that word juggly mean? It means that real violence is not just a matter of physical confrontation. Real violence is anything that's done that intervenes, interferes with someone's quest for self-realization. Anything we do to another that involves that person in such a way that intervenes, interferes with their ability to move expediently toward getting out of this incarceration. This body, these material universes, is all part of a temporary situation. And that's why all the great teachers are telling us that there's something greater that we can be a part of if we are, in fact, ready to share in it, to be able to use it. So, 
as we understand and function in a way not to interfere with anyone's progression toward self-realization, then we are really being non-violent. In a violent world, in order to be that, one has to be able to counteract, one has to be able to extinguish certain thrusts that are constantly devastating the consciousness. Whether it's just the secular or whether it's the more subliminal, because especially today, you're all engaged in a struggle that is very much subliminal. So many subliminal effects of mind control that's constantly now permeating throughout uh, Marcha Loka or the material world. And unless there is meditation, chanting, unless there is proper diet, unless there is avoidance of illicit sex, intoxication, gambling, you leave yourself open to become serious casualties. A warrior must always be sensitive, alert, and meticulous. Let us go on and talk. We promised we wouldn't talk so long today. <laughs> we want you to enjoy. We've been having so many sessions on the Wednesdays. You know, some people have noticed that we have programs almost every other day, whether it's the mantra meditation or discussions with the vegetarian cooking classes or the Wednesday seminars and workshops or some other thing we hold because of your birthday or your anniversary. We find reasons to hold some program, so we all come together. That is love. The family wants to be together, and so they are eager to share in ways so that it reinforces the ecstasy of the experience. Just as I was thinking the other night, last night, as I was watching many of the staff members and devotees uh, cooking, and I was thinking, that is a real ecstasy, the work and the preparation. Now what happens later, that's, that's the residue. <laughs> But the ecstasy is people coming together in a sense of teamship, being able to make something happen. And, you know, that is the real, real beauty. And that is a real sign of dedication, of struggling, and the enjoyment, the ecstasy of that is watching others enjoy it. So I was sitting back having enjoyment. Maybe I can say that because I wasn't working, huh? <laughs> so I, was, I was up to the 4 o'clock <laughs> behind the hot stove. Perhaps I wouldn't say that, but I, I think so. Sometimes we help out in that way also. So we want to just enumerate a few points and then let you finish with the uh, uh, other types of nourishment and enjoyment. This is called prasad or mercy, to receive the stimulation in many ways. I just want to categorize for you uh, about 12 attributes of what constitutes spiritual warriorship. We're not at Howard, at, or, uh, so you don't have to write it down. It's usually ask you sometimes. So <laughs> if you feel it for you, you'll use it. If not, then file it away. Uh, the first attribute we want to look at, and if we examine these things, we can look at such things in ways of how to prepare ourselves better as we're trying to struggle and move into the 21st century. Because people who are not properly fortified, they are not going to meet the 21st century. That so much is happening now based on how uh, or on uh, aligning individuals as they are becoming more pious or impious. And you see that all over. Demarcation lines is drawn. People becoming either more mad, foolish, ridiculous, nonsensical, or they're beginning to look at ways how to be more holistic, ways of how to be more eclectic, ways of how to go beyond just the normal mundane patterns of eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. First uh, proposition is that a spiritual warrior is to control the senses, to be able to regulate the mind. No one, I don't care whether it's material or spiritual, no one can excel in anything seriously without some sense of regulation, some sense of intense focus, of being able to be very, very fixed. And you can't do that if your senses and mind are all scattered. And you're just going from one thing to the next, one philosophy to another philosophy, one religion to another religion, one job to another job, one woman to another woman, one man to another man, one, and we go on and on. That is a sign of someone looking so much outside for what is inside. They're going everywhere trying to get others to make them fulfill, make them happy, they're hiding behind institutions, thinking the institution is going to save them. And such people will spend the rest of their life, or sometimes many lifetimes, still looking 
for some kind of solace. As we go deeper and deeper into any bona fide system, we're going to come to some of the same basic propositions and considerations. So a warrior is to be very, very intent in regulating the senses because first, if one is committing so much violence against themselves, how can they be of any sense of revolution and salvation for others when inherently they're already bringing themselves down by a lack of proper care and proper concern? Next is humility, number two. Humility is a powerful weapon. In our Western paradigm, it's very difficult to think of that because it's always a consciousness of each man conquering over the other or struggle for the survival, survival for the fittest, whatever that means. However, humility is a way of the individual moving aside and not thinking that within their own intelligence, within their own life space, that all that they see, smell, touch, and taste is everything. Humility is to know that there is so much awaiting for you, and you are eager to get that. Humility is knowing that there is a higher part of you, that you are a servant of the Supreme, you are a child of God, Humility is allowing yourself to move to the side and let the Lord drive. It's not cowardness. It's not self-pity. Those conceptions are for the weak individual. The strong person does not have to be so much boasting, so much involved in the flamboyant, but is more fixed in the internal, and that creates a great, great powerful being with great shakti. We can humble ourselves to the natural, to the universe. We can humble ourselves to relationships that are selfless instead of selfish. As we can humble ourselves and be medium instruments, then we can not only be warriors, but we can be generals. And we can play a major role in helping to uh, make life better for many, many souls. Number three, fearlessness. A spiritual warrior is naturally fearless because when you know you are backed up, you don't have to shuffle your feet. When you know that your actual origin is that of divinity, you don't have to be intimidated. You don't have to have all kind of superfluous or unnecessary crutches because of trying to cover for so much insecurity. Fearlessness is when you are backed up by what is called sadhu, shastra, and guru. There's a way to check the validity of any spiritual uh, involvement, phenomena, experience. Usually we think that, materially speaking, there's so much specificness criterion, and when it comes to the spiritual conclusion, it's all a matter of relative transitorial consideration. But no, there is Great science is how to know. Just as through many of these workshops, we've given you technology, of spiritual technology, of how to evaluate different levels of self-realization. We've given you technology of how to understand different commissions, different gurus, different prophets, or social reformers. We've given you knowledge of how to engage in psychic defense, conflict resolution, stress management, time management. We've given you knowledge and how to know what is beyond the ecstasy, what is beyond, and of course, surely what is beyond just material stimulation. We've given you information that helps you to have a small vision to have a glimpse of the spiritual realm. We have shared information with you that has let you understand more about the extraterrestrials, the angelic beings, the devas, the demigods, the archangels as well. Because there is very distinct orientations, information, experiences that allows one to understand what is happening. Just as when you have pneumonia, when you have hepatitis, when you have tuberculosis, there are certain distinct symptoms. And if the doctor is good, the doctor can evaluate your symptoms and let you know where you're at, what stage of the problem, and what you have to do. There is too much sentimental religiosity, which is just based only on faith propositions. Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Payodhita Jnana Yatsuviragam Jnana Chat Yoda Hoyta come. If you are properly engaged in strong, connected spiritual life, it shows because you begin to acquire detachment to the mundane. 
and you begin to acquire causeless knowledge because you are opening up and you're becoming a channel for the higher. And the higher begins to come down through you. The higher begins to come out through the Paramatma or the Lord in the heart, what some of you refer to in your Christian traditions as the Holy Ghost, and that begins to take over your life. So you become somewhat like a puppet for, for the higher. Last, in fearlessness, one is backed up by the scripture. We'll give you one, one story. Because sometimes pundits or sages, they argue amongst themselves to just to discuss, to evaluate the subject matter. Once there was, uh, in the uh, ancient Vedic cosmology, there was a story of a king who had a very, very powerful uh, uh, advisor. Just as many of you know, much of my work in Africa is in the capacity of a consultant. And I am consulting some presidents, uh, some kings and chiefs, and some judges, etc. Well, this was a part of ancient culture in general, that in the political arena, the politician would constantly check with the astrologer or the priest, and they would have such persons in their court. And often, they would have some tests or some challenges to see if there was somebody in the community who maybe had greater excellence in the subject matter. So in one case, this pundit or uh, consultant, he was a little puffed up. So he was challenging everybody in the uh, town. And so he challenged one particular spiritual master, and the master had no desire to engage in combat with him. But then his disciple, uh, Jamunacharya, he wanted to take up the uh, combat. And so he went to the court, and their fight was mainly a fight with scripture. Because spiritualists, when you're discussing subject matter, you can lay down, well, what scripture are we going to use? Bible, Quran, Torah, Vedas, this, that, that. What system are we going to use? And then within that system, you discuss specifically and then generally based on other precedent according to other teachers and other re uh, uh, revealed writings, etc. Just like in a, in, a, in a court, there is some system to see what is to be accepted by the law, by the lawyers, by the judge. So in this case, they were going to just argue based on scripture. So first, Jamunacharya challenged the other uh, consultant, and he said, first, I would like you to prove that your own mother is barren. And the consultant was thinking, this is nonsense. I'm the proof of that my mother has produced a sibling. And so, Jamunacharya later began to quote esoteric scripture, emphasizing that a woman who has a useless son or a useless daughter is practically like a person who has no child. And so, the uh, other pundit was uh, nervous and angry because he had been insulted in one sense, but he'd also been defeated, that he was being addressed that you are a useless personality. And that is a sign that actually your mother is barren because she's produced such a nonsense person like you who's going all around harassing, challenging, and abusing people. So his second question was, you prove that the king's wife is unchaste. Now this pundit was worried like anything. If he had some physical proof, he's going to be off with his head. And at the same time, if he couldn't prove it, he's going to lose his post. How can he tell his worshipful king that he has knowledge that his wife is unchaste? That there was a, a, a no-win situation. So, Jamunachaya began to quote scripture, authorized scripture, that the king is a representative of at least eight various gods.
and that within the king is all of those personalities. And so therefore, when the king enters into his wife, he as well as other entities are also there. <laughs> and therefore, she is unchaste. <laughs> and the pundit was, other pundit was really worried now. And one last question, what could that be? As crazy as these were, but they were authorized scriptures that gave testimony to basic ideas of spiritual understanding. And then he said last, Prove that the king himself is a big sinner. Now, what could he do? If he did have some proof that the king was a sinner, the king was going to execute him. He could not back away because he realized that this was the last question. So he had nothing to say, but Jemuna began to explain that the king is pious. and Everyone knew that he was a very righteous a king. And that he was somewhat, as far as his subjects knew, rather sinless. So how could such a question be answered? So Jamuna Chaya explains that the king, as he takes taxes and takes money from many, many people who are sinful, he is held responsible for two-thirds the karma of his project, of his citizens. And because he is taking this money, not being aware of that it is basically sinful money. He is not performing certain rituals to eradicate those sins, that much of this sin is being experienced by the king. Now, all of these are principles also of deep spiritual considerations. When someone is in charge of an organization, a movement, a country, they are held highly responsible for what happens under their regime. Haven't you noticed most of your presidents, when they leave office, they age 10 years in one year? You look at Nixon at Reagan. You look at a picture of Bush when he first got in. Look at him now. You see tremendous changes. And the kind of sicknesses that many of these personalities undergo. And if you had the psychic mystic vision to see what happens to them in their next life, some of these souls do not even make the animal kingdom, the human kingdom, what to say. They come back as germs. Their karma is so intense for propagating so much sin, they come back as a little germ with some of the smallest amount of life that you can imagine. So he uh, defeated him in this way. This same Jamunacharya once was being uh, challenged, and this guru came, and he was riding a tiger in the air. And he was coming to engage in some mystic combat. And then Jamuna Chai was sitting on a rock, and he just moved his hand, and the rock got up, and the rock started carrying him around. And the other guru said, oh my God, that's inanimate. <laughs> you made a rock move. <laughs> I better go somewhere else, bother some other person. Well, there is combat in the spiritual realm, not just a matter of trying to show off, but a matter that people compare scriptures, ideas, conceptions. And in the proper cultures, if someone is able to show you something of a higher nature, then you become a part of that and use that. In the day's time, if someone defeats you in something, you want to fight. It comes down to mundane. So there's less and less higher expansive knowledge and more and more sectarianism and stagnation. Let us just go on to a few more points and then we want to stop. So another attribute of spiritual warriorship is truthfulness. We should be able to be so fixed in our realizations and our love and compassion that we can tactfully speak the truth even to an enemy and give it in such a way that it will elevate that particular soul. That is warfare because as you come down to someone else's level, then you have allowed yourself to be defeated. As you engage in proper combat, you not only are trying to avoid being a casualty, but you want to do something that helps to elevate another so that more and more souls have a chance to be free and to move on. Pridelessness and compassion, number five. Pridelessness, because it is better to be right than to be honored. Sometimes we want to pat on the back. We want people to like us. 
but we're not so much concerned with what is right or what is proper. And therefore, constantly, we minimize higher principles. We have to be so compassionate that we are ready, literally, to suffer even for others. Real love is that not only will you inconvenience yourself, but it becomes a joy if you can do it for someone you love. It gives you pleasure knowing that you have put yourself out so that something can happen nicely for someone who you care about. There's a nice story. We're in a story mood today. We'll tell you one or two others, and then we'll sit down. <laughs> the uh, story of another great sadhu. He was a disciple uh, of a great teacher, and the teacher was instructing him in sacred mantras. His name was very similar, Ramanujacharya. The teacher gave him this special mantra and told him, this mantra is so powerful that just by chanting this mantra under certain situations, it can give anyone who chants it realization of the Godhead. Don't tell anyone this mantra. Ramanuja thanked his spiritual teacher. He got on the top of the tallest building and he started shouting out to everyone this mantra as loud as he possibly could. His spiritual master, his spiritual teacher later told him, you fool, I've given you this sacred mantra. And it has such power. And it has such consequences for misuse. And you have one on, the, on top of the building and it shouted the mantra out to everyone. So all kind of ridiculous people, worthless people, useless people, you've given them this sacred mantra. And Ramanuja explained, if they can all use this mantra and gain God consciousness, then let me go to hell and let all of them go on and be free. That is spiritual warriorship. That one is ready to prepare themselves for the benefit of helping others. One may feel temptations, anxieties, one may feel all kinds of suppressions, but one tolerates those things to keep the mind, the body, and the consciousness fit for warfare. One becomes fixed and focused in the idea that whatever it takes to be successful in the effort of conscious raising, one feels that it is not too much to ask to see that there is ultimate liberation and spiritual unmotivated service to the God here. This was the position of your Jesus. This was the position of many of the greater chariots and your teachers. They were literally ready to take the karma or to absorb some of the collective universal karma of the citizens so that those beings could have less weight to be able to launch ahead in the spiritual quest. Such a warrior is a general. And what happens is that the Lord, being so satisfied by seeing such souls, not only helps those souls that that being is trying to connect with, but gives that general even more and more empowerment to be able to represent the higher scheme of, of reality. We get empowerment by becoming, as we mentioned, fearless, humble, by having compassion. It is all about beloved. It is all about love. It is the greatest weapon. And its greatest attack is lust and greed, avariciousness. As there is proper love, people can do all kind of mysticism towards you. It will not affect you. All kind of things can be a part of trying to distract you. But if you are a sufficient loving being, your love will extinguish all things that are unnatural because you are vibrating with such intensity. People come to see us. Sometimes we see some of you every half an hour. Some days from 10 o'clock to 9 o'clock, one after another. With all kind of problems, concerns. And so many of you, the basic ingredient is that there is some spiritual bankruptcy that's based on the fact that you do not love yourself, 
And you surely don't have understanding of how the soul is working to love it so that it is able to experience higher levels of love wherever it may be in seemingly negative as well as auspicious situations. If you are a carrier of such empowered love, then everyone has to come up to your energy or to get away. And therefore, you have a certain protection as you move about and you uplift people, or at least you become a role model so others can see what is to be done. Three or four others, and we'll sit down. Next is material exhaustion. <laughs> No one has ever become God-conscious who was thinking that material life was the all-in-all. All. Running after the rainbow. It is actually sometimes a blessing if you become materially bankrupt. Not spiritually bankrupt, but materially bankrupt. That doesn't mean just financially. You may have all so much wealth and prestige and this and that, but in your mind and conscience, you feel empty. That then can become the destitution and desperation to help you to penetrate beyond the temporary. As long as you are thinking that life is just a matter of making some adjustment with matter, you're going to keep on being a slave of matter. And you're going to keep just making different adjustments and rearrangements just experiencing a temporary release to later more frustration. So a quality of warfare, warfareship, warriorship, spiritual, is literally to become in complete disgust of the day-to-day -day life. If you are too much fixed with it, it's a sign that you are a natural prisoner and you're going to keep on being a prisoner here. And if you are no longer feeling such satisfaction, you are seeing yourself as different than what you are doing, what you are thinking is what you are becoming. Number eight. Obviously, if you are on a battlefield, you don't sit down and go to sleep. You don't doze off. You don't allow yourself to space out. We are every day on a battlefield. But somehow we don't keep letting ourselves think this way and our resistance is constantly getting weaker and then we catch so much difficulty and have to work overtime trying to get some adjustment when if we kept in the awareness that we are always on a battlefield, we would be able to not be devastated by such. Number eight, patience. We're going to 12 points. Patience, now this is really a contradiction. Yes, okay. Because patience is something that's inimical to spiritual life, but at the same time it is most inherent. What does that mean? That means that somehow we're realizing that whatever it takes to be God conscious, we want that. We must have it now. We can't wait another day, another week, another month. We can't wait another lifetime. But at the same time, we are patient, knowing that we're not worthy. But we realize that the Supreme Lord, His mercy is greater than His law. And we realize that Mother, Father, God is just waiting to the point that we are just at a state when we are saying, Thy will be done. We're at a state where we're saying this mind, this intelligence, these senses, and this will is for you. And when someone says that and means that, they can have the empower empowerment, beloved, in actually being overseers of universes. They can have the power of being able to become free to the point where they can go in and out of universes working uh, for the supreme personality of God here a great sense of zeal and ecstasy as they engage in such capacity as, as generals. So the patience is there that you can't have it because we are in an emergency time, an emergency mission. And we're at war, and at war you can't be patient, you can't be slack. But at the same time, even though that intensity is there, there's a side of you that realizes that 
whatever is in the Lord's plan for me, let it be. And when you say it and you mean it, you are under higher shelter. Because you have given up everything else in terms of taking it as a priority. And therefore, all your scripture says, put nothing before God, Bible, Koran, Torah, Veda. First most, love God with all your heart and all your soul. That means you have connected in such sublimity that things are working as you become like a puppet for the Lord. Number nine, or number, whoever have you counting, faithful. <laughs> Being faithful. So my, my record is two more. <laughs> Being faithful is important because faith is necessary in everything, but faith must turn in, into results. And faith must observe things practically. We'll give you one last story as we phase out of this discussion. There's a case of, of a Brahmin and a, a cobbler. Brahmin is like a priest or a yogi. And a cobbler, someone who makes shoes. Well, there was a mystic who had the ability to go and visit in the uh, higher kingdoms and actually visit, visit with the Lord. And so once his mystic was going to make a trip, and the cobbler and the Brahmin, they asked this mystic, when you go there, you tell us what the Lord is doing. And let us know uh, how much longer we have to be here before we can join up. And so, make a long story short, the uh, mystic asked on behalf of these two personalities, say, Lord, you know you got some servants down there. And they want to know what's going on. <laughs> they want me to tell them. And I want you to help me. To give them some information. So, the Lord said, Oh, that Brahmin, who's doing all those rituals and all those austerities and reading all those books and all those scriptures, he's going to be many, many lifetimes before he comes to me. And that little simple, simple cobbler is going to come back in the next life. And when they ask you what I was doing, you tell them that I had an elephant. And I was threading the elephant through the eye of a needle. And the mystic looked and was wondering, what, what is, he said, you just tell them that. So when he went down, the Brahmin, he said, well, come on now, you went and saw the Lord. I want to know, when will I get a chance to go back to the kingdom of God? I've been doing everything just right. I want to know. And the mystic told him, the Lord said, in your case, it's going to take many, many lifetimes. And the Brahmin says, nonsense. I mean, I've done everything proper. I've been religious. I've been ethical. I've been moral. And I've let everybody know that I'm moral. But he says, it's going to take you many lifetimes. Then the, Brah then the Brahmin says, you didn't see the Lord. You don't have the power. You, you probably didn't even see him. What, what was he doing? And then when the mystic told him, he was threading the eye of a needle with an elephant. So, oh, you fool, I know you didn't see him. Then the cobbler addressed similar, addressed the mystic and said, what, what was my Lord doing? When, when will I get a chance to meet my Lord? And, and the mystic says, the Lord says, you shall join him after you leave this body in your next life. And this is what, and just tell me, what was my Lord doing? And the mystic says, oh, he was threading the eye of a needle with a, with a camel, actually. And he said, the mystic says, you believe that stuff? And the cobbler says, yes. He says, because if my Lord can take a seed and make a beautiful tree and all the vegetables and fruits and things can grow from a small seed, what are the difficulties for him doing other unusual things? So the faith was not just for the cobbler, just based on the ritual or the external of just what he thought he was and what he was doing and what the Lord owed him. But it was a scrutinization of just the phantasmagoria of just how the Lord is interacting in his cosmos and what he is doing from the most simplistic. And therefore, the mystic could understand that here is deep consciousness. 
It's not a matter of just the form, but it is a matter of real faith. So we need to have faith that's not just a matter of whether you are Presbyterian, whether you are Episcopalian, whether you're Sunni Muslim or Sufi Muslim, whether you are Buddhist, whether you are this, whether you're that, but it's a matter of how much you are following the laws of God, how much you have purified your consciousness, how much you are free of sense gratification, and of course, in the case of spiritual warriorship, how much you are preparing yourself and keeping yourself fit to constantly go on and do necessary battle. Number 10, wounded. When a warrior, a real warrior shows by what happens in semi-defeat. You know, there's some people, <laughs> they work so nice when everything is going beautiful. And as soon as there's some problem, they're the first to run. They're the first to get out. They're the first to make a change. Well, you know, I think we should do like this now. But the real warrior is one who, even when there is seemingly some temporary defeat, immediately we see how such soul bounces back and learns from that particular encounter, imbibes that, owns it, and therefore becomes stronger from that involvement. That is a warrior. There will always be sometimes some temporary setback. When that happens, the real situation is what we do, how we move on from there. Number 11. The warrior takes each day as a new experience. Every day becomes another chance to serve better. You can't fight in the battlefield and consider that last week, last month, you were successful. And therefore, because you were successful last week, when you go out today or tomorrow, you're also going to be successful because you've got a lot behind you from how many wars you've won. And then you go out tomorrow or today without your weapon because you were tough yesterday. You can't think that you can be spiritually strong based on last month, last year's, ten years ago's devotional service, spiritual realization, spiritual performance. Why? Because the Maya, the sin, is constantly increasing with intensity. So if you are still using yesterday's weapons, Yesterday's realization, yesterday's techniques, yesterday's considerations, yesterday's alignments, yesterday's partnerships, you will be a serious casualty. But if each day you are taking it, that here is another chance for you to accelerate. And that brings us to our last point. A real warrior never wants the war to end. <laughs> The real, the real warrior is always ready to go again because it has become the joy of, just as I said, the joy of watching so much when we have these programs every few days, of seeing people prepare and this one arranges this and that one arranges that. That is so much of the joy because that is a combat. And those kind of activities actually create a tremendous vibration of purification. Your activities do not just stop within your own consciousness, within your own family, within your own immediate environment. Transcendental things have a way to permeate, to reflect, and to bounce around. Many of you now are making more of a serious spiritual quest because of how you have gotten absorbed or bombarded by certain higher energy from certain types of associations or spiritual reciprocations. And many people become weaker and weaker because they are getting constantly bombarded by so many negative and lower energies and they're not getting rejuvenated, they're not getting revitalized, they're not getting recharged. And after a while they start wondering why they're feeling so dry. They start wondering why they're becoming so doubtful, so faithless. Why it becomes hard just to get out of the bed. Why it becomes so difficult just looking in the mirror, looking at themselves and realizing you are a coward. You are a useless, worthless person. You are someone who has not acted upon what we know. If we have to look at ourselves like that, it is very, very uh, unfortunate. But we can consider that here is another chance to be able to serve. 
and that is sublime. So we'll be leaving you in a few days, and when we return in a couple of months, we're eager to see what wars you have uh, uh, become successful in, especially the war within your own consciousness of controlling your own senses and your own mind. And then the wars of in terms of what projects you've been involved in, in conscious raising, as you are involved in such a field of trying to see what you can do to literally to add to a positive aspect of the aggregate awareness. Every single person plays a part in what is the universal energy or intelligence of the planet. So as you do something, you are acting upon making some serious changes in the world. And as you sit back and think helplessly, as you sit back and wait for someone, or yes, someone, someone else to do something, then you're just going to be a product of more and more oppression and more and more genocide and matricide and deicide and ecocide. But we have the chance in this lifetime to be about trying to enter into transcendence while there is still some time. So we'll be communicating with you uh, as we move about on our circuit in different countries. And some of you have signed up to work in the Africa and other projects. And some of you have been uh, uh, involved in trying to set stages for other things that we're going to do, which we'll be communicating with you through the staff members on some of these issues. But we thank you, and uh, we are very happy each time we have a chance to be together. Well, just with one, two, or three hundred, or a couple of hundred of you, it is important that warriors sometimes meet, discuss strategy, share ideas, considerations, learn from each other, and grab it, use it, and run with it so that we do the things that we were sent here for. We love you all very much. Thank you very kindly. Peace and love.